One more quick thing to say about static private property before we get to dynamic private property, which is the main focus of this video. So in the last video, we determined where the private property equilibrium was. I just wanted to point out that that's at a very low level of fishing effort. And a low level of fishing effort is going to correspond to a lot of fish. So if you look at the, the left-hand diagram, we're going to be roughly somewhere around here in the private property equilibrium with a fairly lot of fish because in lower right we had a rather low level of fishing effort. So in the left hand diagram you can now see all, all, all the different cases that we talked about the open access, maximum sustainable yield, and private property and in this diagram you can see the effect that it has on the population size that is on the number of fish. But our main topic in this video is the dynamic, not the static private property. So what we've talked about uh, out until now is a static private property. But the private property owner has the following dynamic problem. Should I catch a fish today or should I catch it next year? The thing is that if you leave the fish in the ocean this year, it'll reproduce. And so, you know, you have a choice between, let's say, catching one fish this year and catching 1.3 fish next year. Should you do it or should you not do it? That is, should you catch the fish this year or should you wait, let it reproduce, and then catch it and its offspring next year? Now, if you were just concerned with the total number of fish, of course you'd wait. But as we know, money that you get next year is worth less than money that you get this year because of discounting and present value and, and all that stuff that we talked about before. So the question is how does the private property owner figure out this problem of how much how many fish to catch now and how many fish to catch later? Now let me point out a firm and open access doesn't have this problem. If it decides not to catch fish this year. The fish aren't going to be around next year to reproduce. Somebody else is going to catch them this year. Because in open access, you don't have any property rights, so what you don't catch, somebody else is going to catch, as long as profit's uh, greater than or equal to zero. So there is no dynamic question in open access, because uh, if, you, if, if you decide to wait, somebody else is not going to decide to wait. And you can't control that. You don't have any property rights. But in private property, if you decide not to catch this fish this year, it's going to be there waiting for you next year together with its offspring because nobody else can catch it in the meantime. So that's the reason why we didn't have any dynamic considerations under open access, but we do under private property. Now, this is one of the rare times this semester when I have to say that you have to trust me. Um, your book does the same thing, that the the answer to the fisherman's dynamic question is too complicated for for this class. It's not too complicated for Econ 5250, although it, the mathematics there does turn out to be the most complicated mathematics of the entire semester. But in this class, your textbook discusses this on page 211, and they have a formula which says the biological rate of growth plus the growth in capital value equals the discount rate. Now, my formula is here, and that's what we're going to be uh, uh, talking about. So again, what, what the book says, the first term is the same, biological rate of growth, and I have biological growth rate, so that's the same thing. The second term in the book is the growth in capital value. But what I have is something different here. It's related to it, but it's percent increase in the fish price. And then what the book says is that that has to equal the discount rate, and what I have on the right is the fisherman's discount rate. So I'm using somewhat different terminology, especially for the second term, but basically what I'm doing is the same thing as what the book does. So let me discuss this. 
the first term is the biological growth rate. And what one does is to add that to the percent increase in the fish price. So the biological growth rate is percent, like 2%. And the second term, percent increase in the fish price, is also another percent. So you can add 1% and another percent as adding apples and apples, not apples and oranges. So that's a legitimate mathematical operation. And what one wants to do is to compare it to the fisherman's discount rate. It's either, it's either going to be, it's either going to be less than the fisherman's discount rate, or it's going to be equal to the fisherman's discount rate, or it's going to be greater than the fisherman's discount rate. Let's take these cases one by one. First case, suppose that the left-hand side is less than the right-hand side. The biological growth rate is pretty low, so the advantage of leaving the fish in the ocean is that it's going to have offspring, but not many offspring, because the biological growth rate is pretty low. In the second turn, the percent increase in fish price. That's another incentive to not catch the fish today, but to catch it next year. But the percent increase in fish price is not very high, or might even be negative. That's not much of an, in, uh, of an incentive. And on the right-hand side, you have the fisherman's discount rate, which is how the fisherman himself trades off the present and the future. So if the left-hand side is smaller than the right-hand side, it's not worth it for the fisherman to leave the fish in the ocean. And therefore, what the fisherman is going to do is he's going to catch the fish now. So on the top, he's going to uh, catch the fish now. He's not going to wait. Now let's look at w what happens here in this last case, where you have the greater than sign. So here, the biological growth rate is a big number. So if you let the fish stay in the ocean, it's going to have a lot of offspring next year that you could catch. In addition, the percent increase in the fish price might be really high. So the price of fish next year is going to be way higher than the price of fish this year. So that's another incentive to wait. So if these two terms are pretty big, and in particular they're bigger than the fisherman's discount rate, then the fisherman is going to is going to ca catch next year, not this year. Because it's just too advantageous, both in terms of uh, fish price and in terms of number of fish, to wait until uh, until next year. Okay, so what's the equilibrium going to be? Well, the equilibrium, unsurprisingly, is going to be the middle case with the equal to sign. If the biological growth rate plus the percent increase in fish price is exactly equal to the fisherman's discount rate, then the fisherman is indifferent between catching now and catching next year. And uh, that means, well, it actually ends up meaning that the amount of fish that will be caught is going to be determined by the demand side of the market, not by the supply side, because on the supply side, the fisherman is going to be indifferent. So there's going to be indifference here. And that's going to be, and that's going to be the equilibrium. So that is the dynamic private property equilibrium condition. Okay, so that the biological growth rate plus the percent increase in the fish price is equal to the fisherman's discount rate. Now, one more thing I should say about the middle term, the second term. Um, I wrote percent increase in fish price is actually the percent increase in marginal profit. So technically that's what the mathematics says. It's not the price of fish, it's the marginal profit, but of course marginal profit is marginal revenue minus marginal cost, and marginal revenue is the same as price in a competitive industry. So there's a relationship between these. But that's the uh, that's the more that's the more technical technically correct way to put it. This is too complicated to graph because we have things changing over time, the percent increase in the fish price. But we can ask how about the steady state? Oops, wrong pen. Sorry about that. How 
How about the steady state dynamic private property? Now you might think steady state and dynamic are a contradiction in terms, but what I mean is that we're going to be in dynamic private property, but we're also going to ask what happens if things don't change over time, if the dynamic private property situation has settled down so that there's no, there's no change over time. Well, if there's no change over time, then this middle term percent increase in fish price goes to zero. Because, the, because things don't change over time, you're in a steady state, so the price of fish doesn't change over time. And, and therefore, the steady state dynamic private property is going to be characterized by equality of the biological growth rate and the fisherman's discount rate. So again, in steady state dynamic private property, the biological growth rate is going to be equal to the fisherman's discount rate. This we actually can graph. Go to the bottom left hand diagram, which is the very earliest one that we drew. Suppose the fisherman's discount rate is, let's say, 10%. To graph this on the bottom graph, what you do is draw a line that has a slope of 10%. So if this is 1 and this is 1 tenth, then it'd be a line like this. So it's fairly flat. So that's the fisherman's discount rate, 10%. And what you do is you parallel shift that line until it's just tangent to the black curve that I have on, on this graph, which is more or less like this. So suppose that has a slope of, of 10%. So it's a 10% slope. That is, for every one unit you move horizontally, you move one tenth of a unit up. So the 10% is the fisherman's discount rate. The slope of the black line is the biological growth rate. And so, and so, this point here is going to be where the biological growth rate equals the fisherman's discount rate. And so that's going to be the steady state dynamic private property point. So here and here, that's the steady state dynamic private property point. It's actually very different than the static private property point. You remember the, the static, the static uh, private property point was right right over here. The dynamic one is has a much smaller population size. And the reason for that is the in the static private property there's no penalty to catching fish later. But in dynamic private property, there is. In dynamic private property, you take into account that the fisherman has a discount rate and cares about it. And so what he wants to do is not hang around and uh, catch a lot of fish in future years, but catch more fish and make more profit this year uh, and sacrifice profit in the future because profit in the future isn't worth very much. And that's what you actually see going on. The story of this, the dynamic private property, if we're not in the steady state anymore, uh, so I can't prove this to you, but I'm just telling you the result of the kinds of discussions we have in Econ 5250 and 7250, 
is that if you start out at the carrying capacity, then the private property industry wants to run the stock size down in a non-sustainable way for the first few years, get a whole lot of money then. The cost of doing that, or the trade-off, is that then it, he's stuck below maximum sustainable yield forevermore once he gets into a steady state, but he's willing to do that because that occurs at a later point in time, and so the sacrifice of money isn't particularly great. So he prefers to get more money sooner, less money later, and that's the story we end up being able to tell about um, how the dynamic private property equilibrium comes about.